Good morning, my friends from Grove United Methodist Church and the community joining us from home or wherever you may be this morning. My name is Gomez. I'm the director here at Camp Dickinson, and uh, I'm joining you alongside the beautiful New River this morning to bring you uh, the message, both uh, in your local church and here online. Please join me in the call to worship. In the midst of our lives, we know you are with us, O oh God. In the midst of our laughter and fun, joys and celebrations, we know that you are with us, O oh God. In times of sadness and tears, grief and struggle, we know that you are with us, O oh God. At home, at worship, at camp, at work, among family and friends, we know that you are with us, O oh God. Thanks be to God. Welcoming God, we praise you for all you are, all you have made, and all you give to us. We welcome you into this place, and to our hearts, and into this worship. Teach us to welcome one another in grace and peace. Amen. Dear God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we pray that you give us sharp minds so we can interpret and digest and live out your holy word. Amen. Today's gospel reading is Matthew 18, 21 through 35, New International Version, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to do so. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Scripture that we shared this morning is the, the core, the heart of what our summer scripture is going to be. Our theme verse is taken from our scripture this morning, the parable of the unmerciful servant. And as we've been preparing for our evening campfires and morning vespers and evening cabin vespers, uh, preparing some scriptures to uh, talk about this story and some of the other scriptures that go along with it, I've been preparing some messages and I've had a few uh, stories that I'd like to share with you that I think really speak to the heart of what's happening in the scripture this morning. Now, first, I'd like to share a story that was first shared with me when I was seated uh, alongside other campers and counselors uh, next to a campfire, sitting next to the water, uh, listening to the, the frogs croak. And a uh, pastor was up sharing with us one evening, and he was sharing about his youth group. And in particular, there were two young ladies in his youth group that he uh, wanted to feature in, in this particular story this day. And it's been a few years since I've heard the story originally. I'm going to borrow a few terms from pop culture that I think will help everyone uh, kind of get on the same page and understanding about some of the folks that are, uh, that are in this story and some of the events that are happening. So uh, the first young lady that he shared about with us, uh, we're going to use the term the popular girl. If you've ever been in a, a youth serving organization or high school, you probably have some concept of what the, the popular kids look like and what that, what that means in our society and in our culture. But uh, for lack of better terms, it was a, a person who, um, this young lady had great grades, she was great at sports, she had all the in-style clothes, all the boys wanted more of her attention and all the girls wanted to be a little bit more like her. And this, uh, this girl from the youth group, the popular girl, as it were, uh, is our first uh, person in this story that he shared with us. And the other person in this story is another young lady. We're going to call her the, the counterculture youth. She was not particularly bought into all of the things that some of our uh, teenagers get excited about at the time and she she showed this by the way that she dressed and the music that she listened to and the activities that she wanted to pursue and the things that she talked about uh, and as she did that this was her way of expressing her own unique identity uh, as she was moving through life as a youth discerning who she was as a young person as you can imagine uh, this did not always make her um, someone that the, the other youth were, were kind to. I think if you've ever been a teenager or been around teenagers, you probably know that it's easy to uh, make comments about others for our own benefit to get a, a laugh or two out of some peers so that we, we look better. And in this story that he shared with us this evening, it was a particularly noteworthy week in the life of this popular youth girl that she had just discovered in the previous week leading up to this Sunday that her parents were getting a divorce. Now, this is a very difficult news for anyone. Uh, when, you're, when you're in high school, this is a particularly challenging time for lots of reasons to have such a dramatic upheaval in your family life. Uh, and as you may imagine, it was weighing on her quite significantly that the, the family life, the, the, the structure in the world that she had come to know all of her life was shifting quite drastically. And there was nothing that she could do about it. And when she came to youth this Sunday, Pastor Joe shared that he enters into the youth room after the service where she had gone early to seek some some solace, some, some private time to be away from everyone else. And as he did this, he encounters that counterculture culture youth that we mentioned a few moments ago. And uh, as you imagine, there were times in the lives of these two young ladies that had spent many years knowing one another, attending the same church, attending the same youth group, where 
our popular girl had not always made life easier for this other young lady. But in that moment, what she chose to do was to embrace this other young lady in a hug and stand there with her as she sobbed and began processing the weight of this dramatic, life-changing moment she had entered into. And I'll never forget what Pastor Joe shared with us after that. He said, that is what God's love looks like. And that was a very powerful idea for me at the time. And I remember thinking that is really, really interesting. I did not know at the time how impactful those words would be on me. I've had the opportunity to share this scripture and, and a message about the scripture at many churches around the New River District uh, this school year as we've led up to, to summer camp and I had a young lady who was visiting with me as we were preparing for the service. Uh, she was sitting in the pew behind me, and we were chatting. And after the service was over, we continued chatting uh, a little bit more about the message. And she shared with me, I enjoyed your, your, your message this morning. And I see what God's love looks like in my community all the time. And I said, oh, really, that's great. Tell me, where, where do you see that? And um, this young lady, she was 82, and she was walking at this point in life using a walker. So she said some things like, I'll often go places and people will, will always wave to me and, and make sure that they check on me, see how I'm doing. They'll hold doors open for me as, uh, as she was moving with the walker. That was, was really important for her because she couldn't do it herself. And she mentioned a few other examples. And I remember thinking, oh no, I don't think I did a good job of getting my point across this morning. Because what she was describing for me that day was a couple things. She was describing courtesy, which is a really important thing. I would encourage everyone who's listening today uh, to find ways to be courteous in your day-to-day -day life. She was describing kindness to me, and kindness is essential. It is an integral part of our civilized society in which we live. But it's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is mercy. And mercy is is a bit of a, of, a, of a sibling of kindness. There's often forgiveness involved in both cases. But the difference with mercy is power. Mercy occurs when I have the opportunity to take from you for my benefit. Mercy occurs when the rules, the structure, the society, the laws that we're in benefit me, allow me to impose something on you for my benefit, for my reparation, for my improvement of circumstances. And mercy chooses to not. Mercy chooses to forgive when something that would benefit you is another choice. Mercy looks like the young lady in that youth room that day, who I'm sure would have probably felt good for a minute to have an opportunity to give a, a verbal jab to someone who had done that to her in the past, and folks would have told her, you were justified in doing that. You got even. But what we see in this scripture 
Forgiveness is not simply someone has done wrong to me, should I forgive them for my own peace or for the, the love of my brother? No. In this scripture, we see a servant who is forgiven an entire lifetime's worth of wages. who then turns around and demands one of his peers give him what is owed to him. I think in a lot of our circumstances in our lives, in our society, we have the opportunity to give others what is owed to them. We have the opportunity to say, I want to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. We have the opportunity to say, I want everything that is owed to me. And we have people around us who will tell us, or justify, that will tell us, you have given them what they deserved, or will tell us, you got everything that was rightfully yours. But I would encourage you to consider this morning. As we live today, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has never been what any of us have deserved. The life that we have received in the blood of Jesus Christ is a lifetime's worth of wages above what any of us will ever deserve. And it is that forgiveness, that love, that grace that is manifest in this idea about mercy because the kingdom of heaven does not look like us with our hands around the throats of our neighbors demanding that they give us what is owed to us. It looks like you are forgiven. It sounds like you are forgiven. When what is owed to me is beyond anything you could ever possibly create, that you could ever possibly generate, even still, you are forgiven. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, Gomez, that's all well and good. That sounds great in theory, and it would be nice if we could do that. But we all have to do what we have to do to get by. I guess that no one that's listening to me this morning is a king or queen of a nation or is a feudal lord of any sort, a duke or an archbishop. The scripture that we've heard, we are not the king. We are the servant. Because all of us probably have some that we owe to someone over here. And as the days go in and out, we find people over here that owe something to us. We are instructed to hear this parable. Not because we are like the king who can give away 10,000 bags of gold without thinking twice about it, but because we are the servant who is in need of his hundred pieces of silver.
Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in your name. Be with those who are grieving, those who are struggling, suffering, hurting physically and emotionally, those who are lonely and brokenhearted, and even those who, in some parts of the world, give up their lives because they love you. Hear our prayers, God, for comfort, for healing, for life, for your life-giving word. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So as we conclude this morning, it's my encouragement to you to find where you can provide mercy and shed the light of Jesus Christ in the world this upcoming week. Not because it is going to be easy, but because the world needs it. And as in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you.